Pat, I don't, I, I have been so excited to talk to you because you have spanned so many decades. You've, right. you've seen it all. You've been there. Yeah. You, you've worked with and been around legends um, your whole life. Yeah. You're 22 years old. It's in the 1950s. You have your own ABC television show. Nin- Youngest ever to have his own musical variety. Right. Show. And that's when there were only three channels. Yeah, three channels. Right. Um, and he- here you are in 1955, and your opening act is Elvis Presley. Yeah. Nobody knew him. So it's not that he was already a big star, but, but uh, he was on his way. But you had more number one hits in the 50s than he did. Yeah, one more. One more, one more, one still more. one more, still <laughs> yeah. one more. Um, you are, they believe, the most recorded voice of all time. Uh, that is in terms of the number of records, records. songs. Yeah. I mean, the most, I mean, of course, you know, many have been played more times. That's the, that's the, the catch in it is that I have recorded more songs, so over 2,000 songs in many genres like six different genres at that you... At least, at least, yeah. Six that genres. you've charted on. Charted. Right? I actually made, had chart records in jazz, pop, rhythm and blues, rock and roll, movie themes, uh, patriotic. How many movies were you in? I've lost count, but about 15, 16. I haven't been counting them, so I don't know. Right. I might miss one or two. I'm right. always re- forgetting something that I did do. You're in one of my favorite childhood movies, Journey to the Center yeah, of the Earth. That was, I, uh, that I was, loved that. It was so um, good. Uh, and you are a man of deep, deep, profound faith. Yep, yep, So, I am. So um, I want to try to just kind of... Go over as much All as all that we stuff can. doesn't really co- come together logically, does it? It doesn't. It does. I think. I think it's why you spanned and lasted and are as whole as you are. I mean, when, before we went on, we were in the dressing room, mm-hmm. and you, know, you talked about um, kissing Shirley and yeah. your wife, and you teared up, and yeah. you're love affair with that one woman. We've, your we whole just had life. our 65th wedding anniversary. We've begun our 66th. And uh, she was my high school sweetheart. Same old story. This, we were holding hands at 16, married at 19. When I graduated from Columbia University, magna cum laude, we had four kids already. At 23, and I was on the cover of TV Guide in my cap and gown because of the TV show. And I'd made like four movies and had six number one hit records. And all of this was happening at once. And somehow we found time to have four children at, at 23 and graduated magna cum laude at the same time. So it's been that kind of life, life of being so occupied and in so many directions. I'm but too eclectic never, for my own good, really. But really never seemingly... Never um, misplacing a foot uh, in a in a bad way. The trouble you would get into is Shirley Jones. You wouldn't, <laughs> right? You wouldn't yeah. kiss her. Yeah, it's not that you wouldn't kiss her in the movie. Just that day, you said, "I can't kiss yeah. you for the movie until I go home and tell my wife." Yeah, and say, "Can I kiss Shirley it Jones?" It wasn't in the script, and the first movie had no kisses, and right. I was twenty one or two, and. And, uh, and Henry Levin, the director, said, now we get to the end of this music scene, and you lean in and tentatively kiss Shirley. And I said, on the mouth? I said, he said, yes. <laughs> I said, wait a minute. Henry, I haven't asked my wife, Shirley, about how she feels about me doing kissing scenes. And I know this sounds terribly naive, but I wasn't planning to make movies. I, all of a sudden, I was, but... but we hadn't even discussed it, and we were having these babies, and we had a serious marriage going, and I didn't want to disrupt it by coming home. Uh, by the way, I spent uh, half the day kissing our friend Shirley Jones. So he put it off for later in the movie, and it never happened. But it, the word got out in the, in the Hollywood Reporter, the Daily Variety, 
the, you know, the media that Pat Boone had refused to kiss his leading lady, and they assumed for religious reasons. And it wasn't. I just wanted to stay married. That's all. So was that... Were you unusual then, too? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, certainly by Hollywood standards, I never... I mean, even back then, though. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, goodness, um, you know, Ingrid Bergman was... They barred from movies for a while because she had an affair with, uh, with the, the director. I forget his name right now. Mm. R- Rossellini? Yeah, Rossellini. Um, but then, of course, now... The, it, you make the front pages in a much bigger box office if you're having an affair. And, and back then, no, when I, even by the time I happened on the scene, it was unthinkable that a, a guy going to make movies might not kiss his leading lady. Well, it wasn't my decision then, as you said. <laughs> right. It was just in that one moment took me by surprise. And surely I did talk to her that night. <laughs> I said, honey... They want me to kiss Shirley Jones, and she said, look, I'm ahead of you. This is Shirley for you. She said, uh, I've been thinking about it, and I know if you're going to make movies, there's going to be kissing scenes. I just want you to promise me one thing. And I said, anything, what? You won't enjoy it. <laughs> and I said, okay, I promise I won't enjoy it. And even when I kissed Anne Margaret and Debbie Reynolds and Diane Baker and, some of the, and Barbara Eden and some of the others, I did kiss I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> uh, and then, <laughs> at least I don't remember enjoying it. <laughs> um, you won't remember this, but we met on your heavy metal tour. Oh um, yeah, and um, and I remember you came walking in, and you had the lollipop and the the chains and the jacket, the leather jacket, and everything, and tattoos. Yeah, and people. Here you had been this clean-cut guy yeah. for your whole life. April love, no kiss. And you lost, you lost jobs. Oh, yeah. Because... Kicked right off Christian television instantly. It, was decl- it went hit, hit the news the next day. The furor about my appearance with Alice Cooper on the American Music Awards, giving the award for hard rock heavy metal. And me... He introduced me as the future of heavy metal. So, and, and, and Metallica, I had done their song, Enter Sandman, and they were bowing to me as they came up to receive the award from Cooper and me for hard rock heavy metal. And they were bowing to me as their new lead singer, which Hetfield, even he was just joking about, but um, who is the lead singer? But uh, Christian television, the, you know, TBN, CBN. It looked to them as if I had just sold out and gone over to the dark side and was lost. How could you, how could you have been working with people? They know you yeah. and them think that. Well, I'll just, tell you. I'll tell you how. Because I had notified them in advance that I had done an album of heavy metal classics, but don't worry, I've gone over every lyric, including Stairway to Heaven, uh, which, you know, J- yeah. Page, uh, of uh, what's his first name? of uh, Jimmy. Jimmy Page was supposedly into witchcraft, and he mm-hmm. was, but I didn't hear any witchcraft uh, words in mm-hmm. Stairway to Heaven. There was a lot of oblique mm-hmm. uh, references to hedgerows and mm-hmm. stairways, and but they didn't say anything about drugs. And so I've gone over the lyrics with a fine-tooth comb, nothing to worry about. These are okay songs. They knew... But they were deluged the next day with telegrams and letters from viewers saying to Paul Crouch at TBN, if Pat Boone comes back on TBN again, I'll never give you another dime. He's, he's gone over to the dark side. He's lost. And so it was that. It was that reaction from the donors that made them had to take. Until a couple of months later, I went on TBN with about 70 Christian bikers, there were more <laughs> hogs and motorcycles out in front of the TBN studios yeah. than ever in their history, and never were again even. But we talked about how quick we had been to, and I myself, I said, look, I got a little of what's coming to me for judging people by their appearance. I had no use for my f- fellow singers who were into heavy metal and all the screaming and cacophony, and I didn't care for the songs or the lifestyle. I never looked into it, but... But, and I had no regard for them. 
But then I met some like Dave Mustaine of Megadeth and, and Alice Cooper <laughs> <laughs> and these guys, and they read the Bible and they have many Bible references and the heavy metal songs about dancing too close to the fire and uh, doom is coming and you better be ready. And, uh, and so I found out that, that they were good guys and good musicians and they were even Ozzy Osbourne. You lived next door. I lived to next to him and his song Crazy Train I found to be a very valid social commentary because he was talking about how hard it is for young people to, to tell what's true from false, hypocrisy, double standards, and we're going off the rail on a, a crazy train. And I, I did what he considered such a good version <laughs> of his record, his song, that when he went on the air with the Osbournes family show mm-hmm. on TV, mm-hmm. The first thing you hear is my version of his song, Cra- hey, Crazy, Hey, That's How It Goes. <laughs> and that, that, they liked my version. They played my version as their theme song, not his version. What, did that, what, is that, what does that teach you about how eager we are to judge one another? It was a big lesson. That's what I'm saying. It was because I went with the... I, you know, people... Music critics didn't get it. They thought I was trying to be a heavy metal rocker. I right. wasn't. I was trying to do songs I found to have quality and doing them with big band jazz, really good music arrangements, which all the original musicians mm-hmm. loved. In fact, all the rock groups, Scorpion and Poison and, and all of them wanting me to do their songs uh, and treat them with respect mm-hmm. as I had these others. And, uh, and I, I, but MCA, they thought my record was a total fluke. They were happy to get away with it. It went to like number three in the hard rock chart. It sold out instantly, Crazy. but they didn't want to follow it up. I wanted to, but I, I went up to several, uh, I bought a Harley and, uh, and the Heritage Springer, top of the line. And I had ridden smaller motorcycles. My wife Shirley had too. She was better at it than me, but, um, but I bought a Harley, and then I went to a couple of love rides promoting the album. Yeah. And up in San Francisco, I, I, I uh, brought a jacket and, and the choker and uh, dark glasses yeah, yeah, yeah. to wear to the love ride, but not on the plane. So people had seen me walk through the airport in San Francisco, and oh, Pat Boone, I go in the men's room, and I change to the <laughs> jacket, and I walk out, and they're shunning me. Now, just... The appearance. Wow. And I realized that's how quick we are to judge people by their appearance. And, mm-hmm. and I, the Bible says, judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you judge, you will be judged. So when I put on that apparel, I was Christi- off Christian television. I, ministers and others who jumped to the conclusion I was just Going seeking to the dark side. some kind of, yeah. And I, I, I realized I had learned a valuable lesson that I, I was being judged as I had judged. And now, you know, I became really good friends with a lot of those guys, including Alice Cooper. I don't call him Alice now. Uh, it's Coop. And he is the son of a minister. Yeah. And he has a, a foundation called the Solid Rock Foundation. And he has been about building uh, inner city afternoon places for kids to go do something productive, including record. Uh, so, I mean, he and I, you know, we're Christian brothers, but, uh, but I had no use for him until I recorded his No More Mr. Nice Guy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let me, let, let's go back for a second. Do you even remember Elvis opening for you? Do, was that oh, a yeah. big deal? Oh, sure it was. It was a lot... It was a lot bigger deal than I realized at the time because he wasn't widely known. But I, when I, I went to Cleveland, I had, and this is something people just can't believe, and I, I didn't believe it either until the cold stats mm-hmm. were staring me in the face. Mm-hmm. But from March of 55, I made my first record, which was a cover of Two Hearts, Two Kisses, uh, a, a rhythm and blues song by the Charms on the Dutone label. 
One heart not enough, baby. Two hearts will make you feel crazy. One kiss will make you feel so nice. Two kisses take you to paradise. Two hearts, two kisses make one love. Okay, million seller. Next record, you made me cry. Ain't that a shame, Fats Domino. Third record, uh, Crazy Little Mama Come Knock, Knock, Knock. And I had three records by uh, October when Elvis came up to Cleveland from Shreveport. He was appearing on the Louisiana Hayride and was considered at that moment a rockabilly singer. That is, he was doing country songs, but with kind of a rock flavor and approach. Because rock and roll only was, that phrase was coming into play now. Yeah. Did you know Alan Freed? Did you ever oh, I, work I with I met Alan, and, and yes, he played my record of Ain't That a Shame, in fact, uh, he wasn't playing the original records yet. Wow. He played my record of Ain't That a Shame, but later he started asking his listeners, you want me to play the original record or, or the cover record? And more and more they were wanting to hear the, the original records. Uh -huh. but, but my record of Ain't That a Shame is what he played. And so uh, I, was, uh, uh, I was coming up so fast that... Uh, when I, I transferred from North Texas State to Columbia University right then, that year of 55. And in October 22nd, I went to Cleveland to appear on a sock hop with the nation's number one DJ, Bill Randall. He picked me up at the airport mm. himself, and he said, um, I now transferred to Columbia. He says, got a kid coming up from Shreveport tonight we want to hear and uh, he'll go on ahead of you tonight. And I said, well, who is it? And he said, uh, oh, you, you never heard of him, an uh, odd name, Elvis Presley. <laughs> I said, I, I heard his record on a jukebox in Dallas, Bill. He's a hillbilly. At Blue mm. Moon of Kentucky, uh, you think it's going to go over tonight? Is this, isn't, isn't this rock and roll time? Well, he, he grinned. He said, well, we'll see. So that night, uh, backstage in the Brooklyn High School, I don't know why it was called Brooklyn, in Cleveland, but 3,000 kids were dancing and Bill playing the records, and I'm back there, and Elvis walked backstage with two or three of his buddies, Lamar Fike, I think, and I forget who, and, and uh, you know, his collar turned up and his hair slicked back and, uh, you know, kind of twitchy, nervous, and I said, hi, Elvis, I'm Pat Boone, nice to meet you. Hmm. And he didn't shake hands, he just, he, nobody taught him how to, Cold at, at fish. that point, to shake hands. And I said, uh, Bill Randall seems to think uh, maybe some good things ahead for you. I don't know about that, but I, I hope so. And he just leaned against the wall, and the guys gathered around him again. I could tell he was uncomfortable. Introvert, yeah. And uh, so then Bill Randall introduced him as a young fella coming up, and you don't know him, but let's give a nice welcome to Elvis Presley. And he came out, and he said, Blue Moon of Kentucky, keep on shining. And uh, they liked him. The way he looked, he looked like the bad boy that the girls mm -hmm. are not supposed to to mess with. Right. But but they liked, but didn't care for the song. But he did it, and they gave him a polite response. And then he says, "Thank you very much. I I, I like to do the other side of that record for you." And it was, a, "That's all right, Mama. That's mm -hmm. all right with me." And they loved that, and they wanted more of it. And he wasn't swiveling his hips or anything. He was twitchy. He was kinetic. He was nervous and it came out when he sang and they liked him they wanted more but he didn't have anything else and then i came on with my three hits currently and uh, got all the screams that night and then i had two more three more hits that year so between march of 55 and february of 56 when he hit with heartbreak hotel now this doesn't seem but anybody can check it out i had six million selling singles, two of them number ones, in that 11-month period before Elvis hit. So he, he created an avalanche, but I was able to, to match him record for record mm. during the whole last half of the 50s. So when, you're, when that happens to you, let me just talk to you as a, as a performer, mm -hmm. as a guy who is uh, a star and a young star. Okay. Yeah, very young. Elvis comes on the scene. You, in 56, you get the ABC show? Yeah, it's okay. at 57, I think. 57, okay. So you get the ABC show. I may be wrong, 56. 
It's in the it's in the 50, yeah fifty seven late late fifty seven right. um, and ABC is the the network of Disney yeah. um, and so you're coming on the scene um, you've got these hits you have money you have television you have fame you have people screaming at you yeah. when you see Elvis start coming up mm-hmm. did that play with your mind at all <laughs> yes because because he was the rebel I I know we had a lot of the same fans they've all let me know in the past. And I kind of knew it then because we were both hot. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, I would, my record would be number one and he would knock me out of the number one slot. My next record would knock him out. We were seesawing up and down the charts together. Who did 50- you, wait, hang on just a sec. Who did you knock out? When you started coming up, who was the big one? Well, Perry Como, Eddie Fisher still okay. was singing, Nat King Cole. Frank? Vic Damone. Frank wasn't having number one records at okay. that point. He, he was... Frank Sinatra, and he was doing albums, but mm-hmm. he wasn't hits. having hit singles. Okay, all right. Um, but the, the, it was the kids' time. It was rock yeah. and roll time. Right, right, it right. Was, uh, so that's, we were the hot newcomers. Right. But I knew that he was exciting. I mean, he was a bachelor, and, you know, he was, mm-hmm. he was sort of the bad guy. He was, mm-hmm. There was a moment in front of the press on TV where they said, they would ask him about two years into it, he said, when are you going to get married and have kids like Pat Boone? Mm-hmm. And he kind of gave it that kind of a little lopsided grin. He said, well, why should I get married when I can, uh, when I, I don't know, why should I buy a cow when I can get milk through the fence? Oh, my gosh. And, and of course, that sent shockwaves all over the place. Ministers, yeah. legislators, yeah. <laughs> and teachers, parents. But, but the kids... I mean, they loved him, and they loved Little Richard, whose records I was covering, and Fats Domino. Did you know those guys? Yeah, met them all, and we were friends. We appeared on shows together. So Elvis was the bad guy, and I realized he was, eventually, he was pepper. I was salt, he was pepper, and, and, and people seemed to like some of both seasonings, mm-hmm. you know. We were competitors, but friendly. Mm-hmm. We, we visited each other in homes in Bel Air. We were both renting. We played touch football. On Sundays, sometimes he had his buddies, I had mine, and we would just play, actually not touch football, it was flag football. Mm -hmm. So you tackled somebody by taking the towel out of their belt. But we also blocked. And Red West, his stuntman friend, told me once, he said, Elvis, back during that time, he says, you know, that Boone hits hard. Well, I'm blocking. I mean, I'm... uh, (laughs) That's what we're supposed to do. (laughs) I mean, he he wasn't into karate yet. And um, so we, we had that kind of uh, friendly competitor, but we were uh, competition, but we were two boys from Tennessee, and uh, he was from Memphis, me, Nashville, and, and we were both seesawing up and down the charts. Who did you, let's, let's stay in the 50s for a second. Did you see anyone like Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis, that you saw and you immediately knew, holy cow, that's huge yeah jerry lee for one and if he if it wasn't for his trip oh to england with his england, cousin right it would have he would have made it right well he did he he, he made it undeniably because his records a whole lot of shaking and uh, and um great balls of fire great balls of fire those records are such classic records of course you know they did a broadway show about um about the four in the sun studio they did a broadway uh, show uh-huh. Uh, it was Carl Perkins, Johnny Cash, Elvis, and Jerry Lee, and they'd all recorded at yeah. Sun Studios. And um, and and Elvis on the tape I have at home says, "You guys heard Boone's new record?" And they and they said, "No, what is it? Oh, it's a good song, man." He said, "But uh, but the, the writer Charlie Singleton sent demos to me." at Graceland and to Boone and he had got it and he's already recorded it and it's a big hit. Uh. And, um, and they said, well, what's it sound like? And Elvis had his guitar and this is in the, on the tape I have. I don't know if it's in the Broadway show, but he started, uh, started, don't forbid me to hold you tight, darling, don't forbid me to hold you tight. Let me hold you in my loving arms. Now I had him because I love low notes. And I, and I could hit the low notes in that song. And it went to number one, boom, in a hurry. 
And um, and that was the one Chris Isaacs can't believe that I did in, in one hour after I heard it in the studio and it was a finished recording was Don't Forbid Me. And it just, because for me, I, it was a, such a kick to sing it and to have the low notes. But Elvis, uh, I tell my audiences when I sing it, if I tell any of this story, I sure am glad I got it first because <laughs> he would have had a very right, big yeah. hit with it too. Um, Johnny Cash, did you know him before his conversion yeah. and after? Mm-hmm. So tell me about Johnny Cash when you first meet him and your thoughts. Well, I met him on a plane. We were flying from west east. I guess he was flying to Nashville from California. And we stopped, you know, back then the, the trans uh, continental flights weren't always direct, I mean, straight through. I think we stopped in Oklahoma City or something, and he got off. But he, I knew who he was. I I'd heard some of the country records, but I also knew that he was getting a reputation of, of having some trouble. Yeah, some drinking or drugs or whatever. And he looked very haggard. He got off the plane, and they were trying to hold the plane for him to get back, but he never came back uh. to get back on the plane. So I divined from that he, he did have some, some problems. But um, later, when after he'd had his conversion experience and was really an outspoken Christian. I did his TV show with him, and I forget what, I think it was, Will the Circle Be Unbroken, or I Saw the Light, or uh, some good song that we sang together, and we were, we were singing together as Christian brothers. And, and he was a very courageous guy. He, he came to see me, he and his wife June, they were being booked into Las Vegas, and his Christian friends would say, you shouldn't appear out there in Las Vegas. You know, that's Sin City. Why are you going there? And he knew that I had appeared there and was appearing there and had some records there, actually, of attendance. And, uh, and he wanted to what was my rationale about it. And I said, look, wherever you appear, you're going to do your show, aren't you? You're going to do whatever the songs are you know? Yeah. And I said, the people that are coming to see you are the same people that see you in your concerts uh-huh. or in uh, state fairs or wherever you appear, wherever I appear. I've learned that, 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 that I don't have to be part of everything else going on there. Correct. And the people who come there don't have to be either, either. They're looking for just good entertainment. And if I can give them good family-style t- entertainment, I'll do it. So you just go in and you just sing whatever you sing including your gospel songs, and they'll love it. And he did, and they did. So, I mean, it, it, we were two, two guys trying to work it out, how to make it work to be Christians and still be successful as entertainers. And it's, it's not easy. Yeah. Um, the 1960s come, and the invasion, the British invasion happens. And this is the first real bump in your career, yeah. right? Yeah, big one. The Beatles. Yeah, yeah, big one. Big. Um, because now the whole room has changed. The whole yeah. world has changed. We did it very drastically for a recording artist. Right. Because I was making, a lot of my money was from record sales, of course. Right. Even then, right then when they first hit. And I had heard them for the first time in England. I heard a song of theirs called, uh, If There's Anything That You Want. Uh-huh. Yeah, da, 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 love da, da, from me da, da. to you. One of their very first records. I thought I'd like to sing that, and I got a copy of their record and brought it home, to, and tried to get Randy Wood of Dot Records to let me record. He said, "No, it's already been out on a label called VJ," and the head of that company was also named Randy Wood. I mean, it was weird, but the, their record had been released and it, nothing had happened, and mm-hmm. so he said, "But you know, they're just English. They're just an English group. They're not." <laughs> big. And, uh, and so when they hit so big and my record sales fell like everybody else's, I got in touch with Brian Epstein, their manager, and got the contract. I had a guy paint court portraits of the Beatles, oil port- portraits of each one separately and then a group portrait. And, we, and he was a businessman, and uh, not the painter. I had a painter to do that from Holland. But, but the businessman friend of mine went to Sears, and we packaged Beetle pictures. And I had the license to sell Beetle pictures. Oh 
And I made more money selling Beatle pictures for a year or two than I was making from my own record sales. Unbelievable. <laughs> and, and then... You know uh, who you remind me of? I'm sure you know um, Art Linkletter. Oh, yeah. So Art Linkletter, my favorite story is Walt Disney took him to an orange grove and said, this is what I'm going to build. You should invest, Art. And Art was like, he said later, I didn't have the courage to say, I think you're out of your mind. This is going to be a disaster. When Walt opened the park, he asked Art and a friend, Ronald Reagan, yeah. to do the broadcast. Uh -huh. Art said, uh, because Walt had no more money left, he said, I'll do it for free. Just give me the receipts for the Kodak counters. Oh, yeah. I want the, I want the license for film. Yes, I'd forgotten that. So he I, had that license all through the 70s, yeah, yeah. which had to be worth oh, so oh, much. Millions, millions. Yeah. Yeah. Art was so sharp. Well, I, I, I was very <laughs> proud of this business thing that I did. Right. And then I, it, that was the reason for my meeting them eventually when they came to the Thomas Mack and did their first concert tour after the Sullivan Show. And because I had brought 30 people from all over the country, because if you bought those pictures, they had tags on them, numbered tags, and you put your name and address and, and uh, send them to us or something, or I, I forget how we collected. But then we brought 30 people out of a, a literal drawing, and they attended the concert. And I've got pictures of me, Shirley, and our four daughters on the front row there. And their concert, which was... I'd had loud screams and a lot of noise in my concerts, too, and Elvis as well. Nothing like this, though, because it was one solid scream from the time they came on stage until yeah. they... You could, you could hardly tell what they were singing. If, you, if it softened just a little bit so you could tell what the new song was, then it's picked up again. What was and it? We met afterwards. We met between shows, and they let me know that they were fully aware of those pictures. And, the, and Paul said, I like these. They said, you make us look very good. Huh. And they, they'd sent out for camera stores to bring them cameras, and they were buying cameras. And John Lennon and, and George and the others were saying, yeah, well, those pictures, we like those. said, Brian has got our names on a lot of stuff we don't like. It's crap. But, huh. uh, but we like those pictures. I visited the cave eventually, their place where they made their first success. Uh -huh. And those, those paintings are on display at the cave. Really? That I had made of them. Wow. And so we, we had that kind of a, of a friendship, a relationship. Uh, what did you, when you were watching this, because you're a performer, you're watching this, and you had to turn around to look at the crowd a few times because it's a wall of screams. Oh, yeah. What was going through your head? What were you thinking? What was it? What... what what did they have? You had to say to yourself, what is happening here? What well, did you think was happening? I guess I knew, Glenn, that, um, that they had struck a chord. I didn't know how huge it was going to continue to be, that they would, get, that they would become more famous than Jesus, as John said, <laughs> yeah. eventually. But, um, but, but I knew they'd struck a chord, that they that they were the real thing. I mean, they were performing live. They sounded just like they did on record. That they were very inventive and creative, and they were so young that the kids could identify instantly with them. I mean, I, by now, I was, I was 10 years into my career. They knew who I was. In fact, they told me that they had bought some of my records, and uh -huh. that this is what Bono of U2 told me, that people like that, that they... I didn't, it occurred to me that when they were kids, they were listening Elvis and I were the big ones. Yeah. And, uh, and they wanted to be like us. Eventually they became bigger than, than yeah. me at least. When I met Bono, it was after they got the Beautiful Day uh, record of the year and we're coming into the MCA after party. And I, we hadn't met yet, I didn't think. But, but he comes up to about yeah, here yeah. on me, Bono, and, and, I, and I coming in behind, I said, I think it's time Bono met Bono. <laughs> he turned around and he said, uh, hello. He said, but he said, we met before. He and Edge, yeah, you don't remember. We know you don't remember. We were just getting started as a group in England. You were on tour. Wow. And you were introduced to us and we, we looked up to you. And I think, he, I think they called themselves the journeymen. I'm not sure. Yeah. They were thought of as a Catholic 
rock group in the beginning. I like Bono. Oh yeah, me too. Oh, nice, what smart, a solid. Yeah, and a caring solid man. citizen. He yeah. he's walked some planks out yeah. there. I mean, he's done things for poor people in in yeah. countries and gone to meet with presidents and yeah. Congress. I mean, he he's really been a, a statesman. And he's not your typical guy who's doing that just for the press. No, no. Let, let me stop here in the 60s before we finish the 60s. <laughs> I, I, you had Project Prayer. This is the year I was born. I hate to tell you that. <laughs> 1964. Uh -huh. It was at the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, you, were, you were helping lead this movement to flood Congress with letters mm -hmm. in support of school prayer. Yeah. Um, it was you, among others, Walter Brennan, uh, Gloria Swanson, Dale Evans, Roy Rogers, John Wayne, Ronald Reagan, yeah, Reagan. Mary Pickford, Jane Russell, Ginger Rogers. Uh, you also, uh, in the early 70s, hosted Bible studies with Doris Day, Glenn Ford, Zsa Zsa Gabor, Priscilla Presley. Mickey Cohen. I mean, holy <laughs> gangster. How? Yeah, because hmm, I always, you know, I was going to be a school teacher, I thought. My, I, Shirley and I, when we married at 19, I had decided this is what I was going to do. Just mentioning Shirley right now. But she thought she was marrying a school teacher preacher. Because that's, and there was a little, little headline in the Nashville, Tennessean, because we were both known in Nashville for singing. She was the daughter of Red Foley, the great country singer, Hall of Fame. Can you stop for just a second? Yeah. I love how much you love your wife. Oh, if you knew her, well, everybody loves Mama Shirley, we call her. But, you know, we were childhood sweethearts and uh, high school sweethearts. <clears throat> and we committed our, the, the headline in the Nashville paper, a little squib, we have it. Uh, Singers wed, devote lives to God. This was our goal. And, uh, and, and I thought she was so happy because, you know, she had had enough of show business and country music. Her dad read Foley traveling all the time and... A lot of drinking and stuff going yeah. on, and now she's going to be married to a school teacher. <laughs> sedate, calm life. Yeah. And two or three kids in a picket fence and regular schedule and so on. How did that go off the rails? No. <laughs> How did that go off the rails? <laughs> well, I won the Ted Mack Amateur Hour while I was still in, in, in high school. Well, I just graduated from high school, but it was the forerunner of American Idol. Huh. Ted Max Amateur Hour was on Saturday nights, big show on, on, uh, on network television. And I entered uh, a contest in Nashville. The first prize was a trip to New York and an audition with Ted Mack. No guarantee I'd get on. But, um, but I went to New York and auditioned, and I sang, I believe for every drop of rain that falls. It was a big hit for Frankie Lane, but a, a song of faith. And I and and it was the voters. I mean, the the winners were declared by votes, cards, and letters that flowed in from Saturday to Thursday. And I didn't expect to win. I was just thrilled. I actually got on the show yeah. to justify having won the contest in Nashville. And and I went right from that show, which was live, into the country where I was singing, leading singing, and congregational. Uh, gospel meetings in the country. It was the summertime. And uh, I was in a place called Beardstown, Tennessee. That it was so far out in the country, they didn't have phones. Now, yeah. this was, what, 53 or something? No, 52. And, and uh, I was having lunch with the preacher and the, and the family that was feeding us. And a car came rattling up in the driveway, scattering pigs and chickens and... <laughs> And a guy stomps up on the porch and knocks on the screen door and says, is there a guy named Boone in there? And said, yeah, he's, he's having his second or third round of food in here. Come get him. And they took me to a house a few miles away where a woman had a, a, um, a setup in her home. I forget what, what am I trying to say? A, 
receiving like calls. And uh, you can make calls and receive calls there. And it was Oscar Schoonmacher. And like a switchboard. Yeah, switchboard. Yeah, okay. That was it. And, um, and uh, Oscar Schoonmacher was calling me from New York. Where, where are you? And I told him I'm in, in this Beardstown, Tennessee. He said, well, you've got to get you back here. You've won our show. You, you're, on, you're on Saturday night again. So that's when the Nashville Tennessean took a picture of me packing to go back to, to New York. And I, I won the second week and the third week. The cards and letters kept coming in. It surely say anything at this point like, oh, dear God, no. Well, we weren't <laughs> married yet. Okay. We, so, and, and, and it was all just a fluky thing. And we married after that. Uh, by winning three times, I qualified for a showdown with other three-time winners if and when it would happen. It hardly ever happened. There are a lot of big stars who appeared on Ted Mack's show and didn't win. Uh-huh. Um, but they went on to big careers. But, but I, Shirley and I married at 19. I moved to Denton, Texas to go to North Texas State, big music school. But I'm on my way to being a teacher preacher. And, uh, and I get the call from New York. Hey, we, we've got all enough three-time winners to have, to have a showdown, and, and we want you to come back. So I went from Denton back to New York, sang, did well, I thought, and... Um, I had to wait now for the next Saturday, so I'm staying in New York to see until Thursday. Staying at a seedy little hotel. <laughs> but Arthur Godfrey had a big talent show on Monday nights. Uh-huh. And so while I'm there, I go over to CBS on my own and ask if I could audition to be on the Arthur Godfrey show. And a woman took me in a cold studio and with an engineer and said, sing me something. I had no music, so I sang, I believe for every drop of rain that falls. The same song of faith I had won the Ted Mack show with. She said, nice, can you come back in three weeks? I said, oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I didn't tell her I was waiting to hear if I'd won the Ted <laughs> Mack show. And I, I said, no, I'm, my wife and I are expecting our first child, and I have to get home. Oh, well, then we'll put you on tonight. Tonight? Wow. And I had to have a talent scout. I had to call a friend who could come and and present me uh, on Arthur Godfrey's show against two other contestants. I sang, I believe for every <laughs> that song of faith, and won the Arthur Godfrey show that night, was on his show the next few mornings. That led to the record contract, because around Nashville, Tennessee at the time, a local boy, yeah. Ed Mack show, Arthur yeah. Godfrey show, this was all to me just a crazy fluke. Uh-huh. I mean, I, I was not headed... I wasn't thinking of having a yeah. career singing. I mean, that was too iffy. I had to have a job. If, if we were already expecting our first baby, you know. Well, uh, by the time I had the fourth child and on the cover of TV Guide, you know, I, was, I had movie contracts, record contracts, Amazing. Uh, all of that, and it happened so fast. It was a blur. So, but yet... Um, Things have changed so much yeah. from them. The people I don't think have an idea of that kind of fame. Three networks, it, the entire country knew who you were at that. I did time. a command performance for the Queen while I was still in college. Crazy. Go to go to the, go to the Palladium, and the Queen is sitting up in the royal box, and I'm there singing. You made me cry when you said goodbye. Ain't that a shame? <laughs> And to my rock and roll songs. And we were told that uh, uh, if you don't get much applause, it's because the queen didn't applaud. They watch her, and if she likes something, then they'll all applaud. And wow. if, if she's complacent about it, then don't, wow. be, don't be too concerned. But I got nice applause, and uh, I'll never forget leaving the theater that night. I had rented a tux. I, I'd never worn a tux, but I, this is a command performance. Yeah. Tux. I didn't know that, that if you have a tuxedo, you don't put a white handkerchief in it. So I, I, I thought I was supposed to have a white handkerchief. I'm in the Dorchester Hotel, and <laughs> I got some toilet tissue. Oh, my gosh. And I did the style at the time was if you wore a white handkerchief, have it embossed, your initials. <laughs> so I got a ballpoint pen and put PB on it. Oh, my it gosh. Here, and I'm wearing it in the command performance. Now I'm leaving the theater, the Palladium. And the Bobbies are trying to help us entertainers yeah. get out to the cars. They're waiting for us. 
And the crowd's out there screaming, and uh, some fan reached over Bobby's arm and grabbed this handkerchief and ran running up the hall screaming, I got it, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought she thought I was either the cheapest guy in the world or I had embossed toilet oh, paper. Oh, that is so funny. Uh, but, that, but those things were happening so fast. So let me go back to the British invasion. They were at least still wearing ties and suits. And then yeah. the 1960s just goes nuts. Yeah. Just goes nuts. What did you think was what do you think was happening then? What 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 was your take on you know the the king movement was was one thing. Then you had Martin Luther uh, then you had Malcolm X, but then you had this hippie mm-hmm. Woodstock th- yeah. that was directly in your and already drug related right. and, and drinking related and uh and people's lives are being ruined. It's either, to get back to one of the earlier questions about, about my perspective, my perspective on my whole career, and why I was involved in all these other things that didn't seem like logical things for an entertainer to be doing, the Project Prayer and many other Christian outreaches right. and all that was because when Shirley and I got married and I, I, our foundation of our life, the way we wanted to live our lives, was to be used by God. When I was inducted into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame, I told the audience, and again, it was a tearful night for me because it was in Nashville, and I talked about the attic that I took over from my brother. My brother and I used to sleep in the same bed a year apart, almost one year to the day. We were both born on June 1st, but a year apart. And I let him have the bed downstairs, and I took the attic, and I, that was my, my place. But I remembered praying up there as a kid in high school that God would use my life somehow for his purposes. I didn't know how that would be, but I just wanted to feel that my life was useful in some way to yeah. other people and not just on, spent on myself. Yeah. So that was my goal, and now to be honored with... Uh, with the Gospel Music Hall of Fame there in Nashville, took me back to that attic prayer time. But that was, that was our, the way we were looking at our lives, our purposes. So you know, whatever happened to me in entertainment, I looked for ways to try to make it uh, have some significance other than just fame or money or whatever. Do you think that's what has kept you on the even keel? Cause oh. I, I found when I, when I left New York, because uh, I didn't expect any kind of anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of a sudden, boom, I'm kind of like yeah. you, just real quick, just oof. And you'd had the okay. biggest show in Fox, yeah. Yeah, and, and it was just bizarre how fast everything happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew it wasn't me. Mm-hmm. And uh, the last... That was the sense I had, see, all along. Yeah. And uh, uh, the last night before I was going to go in and tell Roger Ailes that I was leaving... I uh, had gone to Spider Man, and I they invited me backstage, and I was with Bono, and we were yeah. talking about they were struggling with the, the second half, and yeah. my wife looks at me as we're walking back, and she says, "If they ask you anything about the show, just say you liked it, please." And I'm like, "No, but I I could help. I know." How. Yeah. So they asked, and uh-huh. my wife looked at me like, "Oh dear God!" And so for you know thirty minutes of backstage hanging out with yeah you know these yeah, titans sure. And uh, I get back to the apartment, and it's floor-to-ceiling glass. I, I grew up wanting to live in New York City. I'm right in the city. I, I, I mean, for the first time, I was with cool kids. Yeah. And uh, I said, uh, how can this be God's plan? Look at where we're at right now. How mm-hmm. can this be God's plan to go in and give it up? Mm-hmm. And my wife, sounds a lot like Shirley, yeah. she said, uh, I'm going to bed. <laughs> and I heard Pat, as clear as a bell, if you don't leave now, you won't leave with your soul. Mm. And in pondering that for a few mm-hmm. days after, I think that's where people, that's where fame and fortune destroy you. Because it's a nice ride. Yeah. Yeah. But when it starts to go away, it plays on you so much that you'll do anything to hold it because yeah. you want it. Yeah. 
Yeah. It, how did you avoid Definitely. that? Yeah. Did and you, you'll sell out. You'll you'll yeah. make whatever. And you'll make little teeny compromises, and before you know, you're yeah way off. I see this. Well, I've had moments like the one you just described, and a pivotal one would take too long to probably tell you now, but uh, where I a minister said to me, "Are you willing to die to your career if this is what God wants?" And we were, it was a moment of a prayer up on Mulholland. We, he and I t- took a walk together. Harold Bredesen was his name. And I said, I didn't want to, I never wanted that question to be asked. I sure didn't want to have to answer it. But he's asked it. Are you willing to die to your career if this is what God wants? And I said, well, Harold, I have to be honest. If I know my own heart, I am. I don't know if I know my own heart, though, when the time comes and the decisions have to be made. And maybe the little decisions don't seem like big ones, but maybe. But if I know my own heart, if, if I know he wants me to give it up, he says, praise God, brother. He's going to let you know your own heart. Uh. And within days, I was put in a position where I felt like, I mean, I had already recorded an album for a record company owned by Bill Cosby. They put a lot of money into it. And they were going to advertise it. Forgive me, but they were going to advertise it with ads and billboard. Pat Boone sings his ass off huh. on this record. And I thought, well, I didn't make that up. That's their doing. I'll just act like I didn't know it, that, that they were going to say that. <laughs> 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 and then, but this same minister came to my house the next day and said, brother, I don't know if you know what this means, but God just told me to tell you and it was scripture, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. Uh. Now, do you know what that means? I said, no, I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm just about to sing my ass off. <laughs> <laughs> For Roy Silver, Ed Barsky, and the company that owned Tetragrammaton Records, oddly enough, Tetragrammaton is a Greek word for the name of God. Wow. Uh, but why they called it that, I've never known. But I, it was obviously I was going to be recording and w- a five-year contract with unbelievers. And I had to make the decision. I, I was about to go sign the contract. I called and postponed signing the contract because now I've been confronted. Are you willing to die to your career? And so I went back up on Mulholland, and it was a, I got out of bed. It was midnight. Shirley said, what are you doing? I said, I got to go. Got to go pray. And I went up on Mulholland in a misting rain and um, asking God, "What I've, si- I've already recorded this album. I mean, I've already given my word. If I'm going to commit my life even more to you, does a Christian back out of a contract and out of a, a deal he's already right. made? I, didn't, I honestly didn't know how to do it. So, But I felt there was like a hand on my face and the, and the impression, just tell them your story. Just tell them what's happened to you. So the next day, to my manager's great apoplexy, we sat there and I told Barsky and Silver and the others about what I'd made a new commitment. I might be an embarrassment to them going forward and that I couldn't go along with that ad campaign. And I liked the album. It was a good album. John Stewart's uh, July, You're a Woman, I had recorded. It was a chart hit later. But they listened to my story, and I thought they were going to say, well, you know, then we don't want you if you're going to, if you're going to be Mr. Religious Joe again. Yeah. And, um, but instead they said, this is really interesting. Joe uh, Silver said, uh, you know, let's just don't have a contract. Let's put the record out. We'll scrap that ad campaign. You can, uh, you can uh, do whatever you want with, I mean, you can have the say-so about, about our advertising. But let's put the record out, and if it's a hit, it's a hit. And if you want to stay with us, you stay with us. If you don't, or if we don't want you, we'll just, right. we'll just walk away. And my manager was saying, but you got to have a contract. And Roy said, well, why? We trust Pat even more now. Uh, <laughs> and so we'll just operate on a handshake. And we never had a contract. And, the, and I went out, and again, I got a little teary because standing by the parking meter with my manager, I said, you know, God had just let me know my own heart. Uh, and he's given me the opportunity to put it on the altar, walk away, 
whatever the consequences, but giving it back to me. But the capper is that six months later, Tetragrammaton went into bankruptcy. If I had signed that contract, I'd have been tied down for five years. My contract, I'd have been on a shelf. Uh, so it was not just me. Right. You know, so those moments, and there have been others, and with you, and two, I'm sure, where we, we get some guidance and we, we have to make decisions that we hope are the right decisions, even if they cost us. I am um, before, uh, and I've never talked about this before. It's I don't a know. Fantastic story. Um, before that night that that happened to me, uh, it was about a week before. Uh, I had had this feeling for a while that I needed to talk to Billy Graham. You know, Billy Graham's not taking my call. Um, <laughs> oh, he and, would uh, have, of course. And so uh, I'm standing in the hallway, and. Um, and I said, I, I just have to talk to Billy Graham. And uh, that afternoon, Billy Graham calls me out of the blue. Doesn't know I've been trying to call him. Really? Yeah. And he said, uh, can you come down to the house uh, this weekend? Spend an hour with me. I just want to chat with you. I'm like, all right, God. Get down there. And uh, he says, what's happening with you? And uh, I said, well, I'm... I'm thinking about leaving Fox. And he said, no, 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 that can't be right. And I said, I've been praying on it, Billy. I said, but I, I just, I don't know. Kind of like, I don't yeah. Yeah, know. It's hard. And it's insane. And uh, he said, uh, tell me how you know that's from Christ. Mm -hmm. And he sat there and he held my hand and uh, we spoke and we both just wept. You know him, right? Yeah, yeah, very well. What a great man. Oh, yeah. What a oh, great the man. The real thing. And um, his whole countenance on this issue changed, and he said, sounds exactly like the Lord. Mm -hmm. And it, it gave me such strength because he said to me, I have tried my whole life to do right. And then he welled up um, in tears and he said, and I haven't always gotten it right. Mm. He said, but I've tried. Oh, yeah. And he said, um, and I know the Lord knows that. Yeah. And then he just changed and his eyes became so bright and he said, and I don't fear death. Yeah. I just don't know. <laughs> it's, it's such a great, it's yeah. such a testimony builder. Of, yeah. You're going to have really yeah. tough decisions and, you know, seek his advice, the Lord's mm -hmm. advice, and then do it. And even yeah. if you get it wrong, yeah. you were trying. If you were, yes. I, I've made mistakes and blunders uh, that, that from a business standpoint and professional standpoint, were just unwise and maybe they not what God expected of me that I, but I was thinking it might be so I would try to do what I thought was right and I later thought boy that was really stupid you could have gone ahead and done whatever that was a role in a movie or something I've I've said in the past I would play Judas in a in the story of Christ because I know how the story ends and it's it, it it's I would play the bad guy if I had to yeah. uh, and try to do a good job, try to make him a human being. Yeah. Uh, because Judas went out and hung himself when he realized what he had done uh, right away. Um, so it's a, it is a great story, a human, really a human story. But the, to try to combine um, uh, our knowledge and our hope to, to do what's right uh, with the, the demands of a secular world that doesn't know him and thinks we're nuts uh you know i all the uh, other performers have made fun of me and i repeat the jokes you know in my shows you know dean martin used to say every show he did for a while oh I, pat boone is so religious i shook hands with that boy the other day my whole right side sobered up <laughs> <laughs> and phil harris uh, with Andy Williams on Andy Williams' show, stopped in the middle of the show. It was not part of the script. He said, uh, Boone, come on now, level with me, pal. You drink, don't you? I said, no, you don't drink nothing, never. 
I said, no. He said to Andy, he says, can you imagine waking up in the morning and knowing that's as good as you on a field all day long? <laughs> and then he says, come on. He says, he said, Pat, he said, we love you. I said, we kid you, but we love you. And he said, if I ever had a son, I'd want him to be just like Pat Boone till he's about three years old. <laughs> <laughs> and so they kid me, but I, I just tell the jokes on myself because yeah. I know they're funny. Was it about 1972, five? I don't remember when. Your daughter had uh, oh, one of the biggest. 77. 77, was yeah. that late? Mm-hmm. One of the biggest hits of the 70s. Yeah. You light up of my Of all life. time. It's, it's one of the biggest to this day. One of the biggest, like, it was number one, like 13 weeks. There's one, I think two records matched it. Dinah Shore's Button and Bows, Buttons and Bows from a Bob Hope film, I think. And uh, the Mills Brothers, Glowworm. Wow. There were two records that were number one as long as Debbie Boone's record of You Light Up My Life. And the great story, this is a terrific, sh- my favorite showbiz recording industry story. She was still living at home. She was 20. Uh, she and our family had performed together because that was my strategy to keep my four pretty teenage girls in sight at all times. Yes. Was <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I've got my girls all living by me too. <laughs> yeah. And so Debbie was still at home and Mike Kerb, uh, a guy named Joe Brooks had written this song, You Light Up My Life, for a movie. He was the top jingle writer in New York and making a fortune and, and his mistress, live-in girlfriend, was... Um, was uh, had recorded the song already for a movie about them. It was a real kind of an ego trip uh. thing about them, but the song was beautiful. But she was holding him up. You would not sign a beginner contract for Warner Brothers because she was uh, singing in New York. She hadn't had any hit records, but but she was a professional singer, so her agent didn't want her to sign a beginner contract. She was holding everything up. Mike Kerb had Debbie come in, first played it for us, do you like it? Oh, it's beautiful. To see if we could put her voice on the record so they could put the record out because the woman was holding them up. And so Debbie on the way into uh, New York with Shirley had her face to the window and she was singing, you light up my life, you give me hope to carry on. And she said, I could sing this to the Lord. Shirley said, we'll do. So they go in this cavernous studio in New York, Joe Brooks, very cynical guy, and uh, just him and an engineer and the tape they had recorded already, and they had a a blank portion of the tape, and he said, well, let's just hear you sing this song, Debbie. So they already had all the instrumentation done. All done. done. The record was finished, the other girl finished, but they had the tape there, so they just, uh, just softened or deadened one of the tracks and let her sing and she just closed her eyes sat on a stool and sang you light up my life and joe got goosebumps everybody did and uh, he started trying to get her to make some changes in what she was doing and it was making debbie nervous so shirley said excuse me joe can i take shirley and i just want to calm her down a little bit this because she's a little nervous went in the bathroom said the most messy bathroom she ever saw (laughs) but in a recording studio and uh, so she's, uh, she said, you just go out there and pray and do it your way. Went back, the next take was it. It instantly, they just took the other girl's voice off. They didn't redo the music. They just put Debbie's voice on, took the other girls off. And the record became the biggest, one of the biggest records of all time. And people get goosebumps when they hear her sing it and did all along. And, and, uh, they just get a, a feeling because, and I know what it is. It's the spirit. Yeah, it's the spirit yeah. in which she sang it. She sang it in front of Barbara Streisand, and and her record matched her record of, um, oh, Paul Williams' song "Not Easy Being Green." I think it was <laughs> oh, yeah. a, a, one of those songs. No, no, it was the song she wrote. That wasn't it. It was the song she wrote. Can't think of it. But and then on the Grammys and the Oscars. But funny thing. The, um, the Grammy, she tied with uh, Hotel California. Uh. And Hotel California, the Eagles, is about hell. <laughs> uh, 
uh, it on yeah, their right. album right. cover. There's uh, on the inside is a picture of Anton Lavey on uh, by on purpose in the on the balcony of a hotel in Palm Springs that represented Hotel California. But the lyrics say, "You go in and you never come out." Right. You can have anything you want, but right. You know, you'll be sorry. Yeah. And and uh, and that song and you light up my life. Interesting. Were tied for record of the year. Interesting. Hotel California about hell and her song to the Lord, You Light Up My Life. So I've oh, yeah. lived in this kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, tug of war, it seems like. Yeah. Uh, although I've loved it, but, but it's, it's been uh, walking a tightrope sometimes. I just have to tell you this because he's my friend. I have a friend, Jeremy, and uh, he, uh, I walked into his house. He lives in Sherman Oaks. Mm-hmm. And I walked into his house. And I said, this is like walking into somebody's house from the mid-1970s that was a superstar, and nothing's changed. He said, right? He said, I bought it because it was Debbie Boone's house <gasps> that she bought with You Light Up My Life, and yeah. we can't change anything. Oh, that's great, because it's a lovely home. <laughs> yeah, it a is. Lovely, it lovely is. Lovely home. He hasn't changed a thing, and they won't. And they, they won't. won't. Well, good, because yeah. it was beautiful. And they yeah. did it. They redid it themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about um, the talent of today. Let's talk about, um, do you know Michael Buble? Oh, no, I haven't met him. I know who he is, of course. Okay. A great admirer of his abilities. Yeah. Um, who, who, who is out there that you say, wow, a lasting talent, a lasting voice? Well, you just named him, and he is... He is um, really good. I mean, he's just got a great native talent. And he's Have you really ever seen him it. in concert? No, I've just seen him on television. You and need so to see him in concert. I, I, think, I think he's the, uh, and I've seen Michael Jackson and everybody else. Yeah. I think he's the best performer on stage I've ever seen. Well, I agree with that. Stage performer as well as vocal because yes. uh, he throws himself physically into it, but in his own way, he's not yeah. imitating anybody. Yeah. He sang on the um, the Voice the other night, yeah. and uh, and he sang a, a song, a, a love ballad, and um, I, he sang it very slow. Now I, I thought he may have been thinking about Tony Bennett when he sang, "The Shadow of Your Smile." <laughs> Tony Bennett sang it so slow, you had to check the speed on your player, <laughs> but it, but it worked. Was it my funny Valentine? No, no, no it was a it was um, a, just it doesn't a, matter a love song, but mm-hmm. but I thought no, no, Michael, that you don't need to stretch that one out because you know what you're going to say, and so, but I mean that was just a, a judgment he made. I didn't agree with, but but his vocal ability is just unmatched, I think, right now. Yeah. Because um, he can sing most anything he wants and sing it well. Yeah. I don't, I, other singers around, I, I'd have to rack have my you, brain. Have you, have you met somebody that was a, um, a mid-charter, if you will, that you thought, if this person would just straighten up their life, have you met anybody who could have been huge that was just, burned out well some of my good friends i mean glenn campbell you know he went through real tough period time. yeah went through a rough period I mean, not before he had uh, the alzheimer's i mean he he yeah. got involved with drugs and was messing up his life that's too bad um and there there are others i don't want to yeah yeah they, it, it, yeah i have i've i've and in fact that's why i didn't want to be plan on being a singer. I had early in the going, when I was touring for my first record, I went into some grill some night, one night with the promotion guy for my record to get something to eat. And up on, behind the bar was a guy who'd had one record. And it had been a hit record of sorts. But he was building his life around that one record. And he's up there singing behind the bar. And I thought, boy, I, wow. I can't bank on this. And when young people have asked me over the many years about how can I get to be 
a, a star. How can I have the success you've had? And I said, I can only tell you how I did it. I made God my agent. Right. Because the agents, you know, they can open doors for you. They, in, in the case of God, he gave you whatever ability you have. And he can open doors and create opportunities, and he can help you make the most of them when the time comes. And by the way, like all good agents, he'll expect a tenth. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I got an agent, and, and, and he said he charged 10%. I called him about three weeks into our deal, and I said, you know, I pay God 10%. Uh-huh. I pay you 10%. Yeah. I am crystal clear on what God has done for me. Yeah, yeah. What are you doing? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're charging the same. Uh, yeah, you're charging yeah, the same but rate. That's another thing I've been scrupulous about. You know, uh, uh, tithing because when I was making fifty dollars a week in Fort Worth doing two TV shows, and I was in school at North Texas on my way to being a teacher and doing two TV shows locally on WBAP uh. Channel Five. And, um, and, a, and a radio show, only did it about three weeks. It was l- the lowest rating in the history of radio. It was called Organ Moods. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, that <laughs> sounds good. A college student reading poetry while a guy droned away on the organ. Oh, wow. Sunday nights late. And people gave their radios away, and <laughs> they didn't ever want to have come across that by accident again. But two TV shows, driving from Denton to Fort Worth and back, $50.00. Uh, forty. Uh, what was five fifty taken out withholding? So I got forty four fifty, and that was Shirley and I living on that, and I tithed it on a in church. But within a year, I was making more money than I knew what to do with, and have continued, of course, yeah. all this time because I don't know if I, I have similar story, um, but I think I've learned a better story on tithing, and that is. Uh, I just trust him, Mm -hmm. you know, it's not like I'm going to get anything out. I might not get out what I'm thinking I'm going to get out of it, you know, but I just, I just know Mm -hmm. it's going to be okay. Whatever happens, it's going to be okay. I'd like to know what happened to that woman with the two mites, you know, she just, she wasn't doing it for show. Right. She wasn't expecting anybody to see it and she'd have been maybe embarrassed. Yeah. But she put her little two mites in the collection plate. And Jesus said, see that? These wealthy guys, they give a lot more. Yeah. They do it for show. But we'll be talking about her for as long as yeah. there's a world. Yeah. We'll talk about that woman and her two mites. So, you know, God sees it and he knows it. And he knows our heart here while we're doing it. And um, I think we can tithe to other people and their needs as well as to you know, spiritual programs. So let me, um, let me take one, one, we'll take you one more place. Cause it is the center of who you are. And it's God. Things are changing quickly. And, um, boy, are they, it would not surprise me if, you know, I pop on TV tonight or, you know, my, my iPhone and it just says, uh, oh, Jesus came back. I mean, it's like things yeah. are happening and changing oh, so fast, oh, yeah. so dramatic. Right. And but you won't, you won't have to read about it. Yeah, I know. No, we'll, we'll see it. Um, <laughs> um, but one of the things that I'm, I'm fascinated by is this, this lack of connectiveness to God in some way. Mm-hmm. And you're seeing the suicide rates go up. You're seeing all these yeah. stats go up because people don't have meaning in their life. It's what gives us, yeah. at least for me, it gives mm-hmm. me meaning. Um, and religion on the wane. But mm-hmm. you lived through it in the 70s. After the 60s, there was this Jesus movement. Yeah, in the 70s, yeah. Right, and it was... You know, God is dead in the 60s, yeah. and this Jesus revival, yeah. and it wasn't a church thing. It no. was a Jesus It was in thing. the streets and the beaches and the Correct. rivers. The, we, were, we had 300 baptisms in our swimming pool, but people were going to the oceans and the rivers because the kids were saying, 
wow, they'd read about what happened on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 were added to the church when, on the day that the, quote, church began. And, uh, and, and they were baptized immediately. So they, they looked around. Well, and many churches in Southern California don't baptize at all. And if they do, it may be a sprinkle. Right. But, um, but somehow on that first day on the of Pentecost, 3,000 were baptized. So in the 70s, um, there were lots of baptisms in the oceans, rivers. And do you think that there is a... Uh, a revival, if you will, that's coming, that's more, it, it feels to me that man, and I have to be really careful of this, but man is responsible for religion. Mm-hmm. God is uh-huh. responsible for the principles. Yeah. And yeah. man screws up the principles, yeah. you know, sometimes with doctrine or, or greed or whatever. Yeah. And there seems to be this disconnect with the stuff that man has created and a beginning of this bubbling up of, I want to do something good. I want to mm-hmm. do something meaningful. Yeah. I, 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 all of the principles, mm-hmm. do you see that? Do you see that at all? Or uh, is it yeah. a little darker in your view? <laughs> no, no, I do. I think, I think we're being forced into a, a, a time of choosing I think uh, that as the things get worse and worse, and and I just I'm, I read through the Bible every year, and this this the day I was reading in Revelation. Now I'm up to the yeah I'm up to the Book of Revelation, the end of all things coming, and the the horrible things that are in store as as the world gets worse and worse, and even those horrible things are God's attempt to bring the last few to Himself, even in times of of horrible or, uh, travail because uh, as long as things are going okay, they just don't feel they need him. So he will finally let things get worse and worse and worse till, till we're sort of backed into corners, which is sometimes where we, <laughs> where we make our right choices. But, um, but I think the things are crumbling and, and we're losing so many of, I've, I've made a couple of speeches, had to write them out. One's called losing liberty. How can we possibly in this country lose liberty? We're the greatest nation in the world. We can lose it through apathy, ignorance. Those two ways we can lose it. It's being taken from us now. I mean, right now they're changing, wanting to change the Constitution. They're wanting to uh, take uh, to call some things in the Bible hate speech, and 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 they're not wanting. Uh, people to say under God and the Pledge of Allegiance, right. and uh, these things are happening. We're going to have to take stands eventually, because uh, you, you remember the up with people thing a long time <laughs> yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up, up with people is yeah. people wherever you go, and freedom isn't free. You got to pay the price for your liberty. So I think we're coming to that. I, I'm just hoping that we're going to that there will be a return. I think even show business people uh, are, good, are giving people, and they, they go out of their way to do good things yeah. just from a human, humanitarian yeah. standpoint, which is good, and maybe don't get enough credit, but it's, it's on their part, it's, it's trying to answer the call that I think we do feel. All of us, most of us feel that we like to, if there is a God, you know, we'd like to be in his good graces. We'd like to please him. I, I feel sorry for people like Bill Maher who make fun of anybody who is, quote, religious. And I understand how, quote, religion, which is not what God wanted. He wants relationship. Yeah. Uh, he wants people who want to be like him. That's it, people. It's, it's like Gandhi said, I, I love this Jesus of yours. Mm-hmm just don't like his followers. Yeah. And it's because yeah. a lot of the followers are just as judgmental as Bill Maher is. Right, right. And, and as I say, I, I found myself guilty of that too. So yeah. <laughs> I've, been no, I've been no saint, although technically you can call me St. Patrick. because <laughs> <laughs> You've been around some snakes in your life. I yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's, it, it's a, a wonderful life to live... 
believing that that God is in charge and that he he'll he'll ex- excuse you and and even work with your mistakes and errors and judgment and it'll all turn out if turn out well if um if you're trusting him and that as we and what I'm looking at right now and in the case of several good friends uh who we've said goodbye to temporarily that they didn't die they didn't cease to exist they moved on you don't have to talk about a saint that is somebody who the bible says precious in the in the sight of god is the death of his saints that's in one of the psalms precious in the sight of god why precious because he brings them to himself and that ain't bad yeah it's a good time yeah. it's a time to celebrate it is if uh if if you if you've become part of his family. Yeah. That's the thing. And we yeah. can all, every one of us can be part of his family. Okay, we're kind of rapid fire. Couple, yeah. A <laughs> couple things, just real quick. Uh, greatest experience of your life, something that you've done that you were like, I cannot believe I did that or I saw that. Hmm. I just... Uh, <laughs> I showed, I know this seems trivial, but for me it wasn't. Um, I was in Dublin making a movie, and um, I had a couple of days off, and uh, I, I had a bike. I was renting a bike so I could ride around, because I'm Scots-Irish myself, and I wanted to see more of, of Ireland and around Dublin in the spring, and there was an AAU track meet. And, um, and I, on my bike, I stood on the wall in the stadium outside the stadium watching the thing happen, and Americans and Irish compete. And somebody recognized me and had me come over, and I was in the infield talking to some of the coaches while all the things were going on around me, and, he's, and I'm in shorts. He said, you're like you're in pretty good shape. I said, yeah, I am. And he said, uh, you ought to come out here tomorrow and run in our 440 relay. Our dash man is taken sick. We're going to have to cancel. <laughs> and I said, Really? And he said, yeah. I, and I said, well, I, I never ran track, but I think I'm pretty fast. Oh, he said, no, I was just kidding. I, I mean, if you haven't run track. But I must have wheedled him or something. I, he decided, hey, you know, if you want to do it, we'll, um, we'll talk to the Irish coach and we'll, we'll do the event. It won't be official, but, you know, maybe we'll see if we can, if you say you're pretty fast, maybe we'll yeah. build up a lead and you can bring the baton home or at least make a good effort. I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. I came back, my manager was apoplectic again. He thought, how can you be setting yourself up like this? And I came back, and they gave me a tr- uh, some shorts and some track shoes I'd never worn, and, and the baton, we practiced passing the baton the safe way with your thumb on the hip, and the guy comes running it behind you and puts it there, and you got to make sure you got it running. And now they tell me that there's more people in the stands. They've heard the words around, I'm going to be running in this... Uh, track me yeah. against their team and they decide they don't want to get beat by three track men and a singer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so they bring in noel carroll who was in stanford but he was irish and he was running for the irish team he had just set the world record oh my god in the two mile now he's going to run anchor against me now i want out i don't right. i know this is going to be embarrassing but I'm out. I can't, I'm in it. I can't get out. And so now the gun goes off, and I look down at the, and I see the first 110 yards, and the American guy builds up about a three-yard lead, passes the baton, and now here comes up to the second guy, and it's up to about four or five-yard lead, and here comes a guy toward me, and I put my thumb on my hip, and I start running, and I feel the baton, and I go take it round the, and I'm running. I said, no man alive could catch me. Da, 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 da. But I'm here. Da, those are my steps. Da, da, and I hear thump, thump, thump. And this two miler, world record holder, is coming behind me. And on my phone, and I, I could show you the picture that, that somebody sent me recently, Associated Press. I cross, I break the tape. I half a step ahead of Noel Carroll. Wow. Won the AAU. Yeah, of course, it wasn't official, but it was right. in Sports Illustrated. But you, you mentioned a moment in your life that yeah. seemed impossible. That I would win an AAU track meet. That is great. Uh, and there's a picture to prove it, yeah, yeah. just as I'm about to break the tape. I say it's probably trivial, but, but then being inducted into the, to the Gospel Music Hall of Fame, 
was a very emotional moment. And, uh, and to me, you know, you hear what I'm about, what yeah. my life is yeah. dedicated on Thank and you. to, that to be in the Gospel Music Hall of Fame and now, that music that they award, gave me an award for is what the way we start our day every day, Shirley and I. That album I did called Songs from the Inner Court is it was it's from the tenth chapter of Hebrews where it says God, Jesus took away the the curtain into the, we can now come into the holy of holies and right before the throne and so in my album Songs from the Inner Court which Christian bookstores it was too religious for them because it wasn't performance it was worship but we started every day. Uh, and uh, to create an atmosphere of worship uh, while we're trying to keep Shirley with me while longer. And uh, so that induction into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame is, is evidence that what I started out to do has been recognized and uh, by people that I really care about and, uh, and something that is most important to me. So that is something that's better than an Oscar or I'm not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, never will be, because I didn't just yeah. record rock and roll. I had more rock hits than some that are there, but, uh, but that doesn't matter to me at all. But the, I, I like being in the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. I know that... Uh, I, I know that... Uh, how much you miss your wife. And I oh, yeah. can't tell you how much it means that you would travel out to take time away from her and sit in a very cold studio with, <laughs> with me for a while. Well, this, this I've, I've wanted to do this for a very long time. I mean, I first started watching you on Fox and I was cheering you on all the time and then dumbstruck when you left. But now I know you made the right decision and I'm glad that you're still speaking out about the right things. You're like, uh, you're like um, Paul Revere. I'm glad you used Paul Revere. Because sometimes people will use people from the Bible, and everyone they use dies. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, no, stop that. Paul Revere is okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul Revere. He just kept saying, "They're coming, they're coming." Yeah. And that's the way I always saw you: was you, you had the blackboards, and you yeah. were showing the facts that nobody should be able to to refute, but they weren't getting the message. You were putting all the facts up. A lot of people they, did. Yeah, they did. A lot did. of people oh, did. Oh yeah, yeah, a lot sure of did. did. So. Pat, thank you. Thanks for this time. It's a privilege for me. 